Blog Talk Radio. COVID-19 will fuel the next wave of innovation. And the first thing I'm going to say is I've been podcasting for 14 years now. And I had someone a few months ago tell me, why don't you do a show around the pandemic and talk about how the plagues of the past have influenced what's going on today. Well, I didn't do that, but I did come across something that makes it feasible to help me do a show around that title just simply because what it does is it's just showing you how what happened in the past and what's happening now is influencing how business is going to be done in the future. And this is something that's really been going on since the advent of the Internet and the breakdown of the computers from the big old IBM computers that took up full rooms to where you now have the net pads or the little netbooks where if you do nothing but get on the Internet, then they are your little, like, iPads, notebooks, anything that's small that just gets on the Internet. If you do need storage because you're creating classes or you're always downloading things that you need access to, then you need a computer. But here's the thing. You have storage in the cloud so that when you're on your little netbook, You can always get into those files and work from anywhere. The global pandemic will shape businesses for decades to come. Black swan events, such as economic recessions and pandemics, change the trajectory of governments, economies, and businesses, altering the course of history. The Black Death in the 1300s, broke the long-ingrained feudal system in Europe and replaced it with the more modern employment contract. A mere three centuries later, a deep economic recession. Thanks to the 100-year war between England and France, kick-started a major innovation drive that radically improved agriculture agricultural productivity. Now, fast forward to the more recent times, the SARS pandemic of 2002 to 2004 catalyzed the the meteoric growth of then small e-commerce company called Alibaba and helped establish it as the forefront of retail in Asia. Now, One of the things we can say about Alibaba is if you are running a company where you are looking for products that you can sell on your website, then Alibaba is one of the best resources available. There's a few others, but if you are looking for a deep, deep discount, that you can really make an income on by charging comparable prices to other prices in the USA or even in Europe, you will make a profit. The growth was fueled by underlying anxiety around traveling and human contact.
contact, similar to what we see today with COVID-19, the financial crisis of 2008 also produced its own disruptive side effects. Airbnb and Uber shut up in popularity across the West as the, the subprime crisis met lower savings and in income for the masses, forcing people to share assets in the form of spare rooms and car rides in order to cover for the deficit. Doubling down on this trend, video game business models rapidly changed as well, with 2011 seeing the rise of the free-to-play business model, thanks to Nexon in Asia and King in the West. Now, here's the thing that we are getting at here, is that everything that happens usually creates a change in how we think about how we do business today. So if you look over the past history and how that influences what we do today, you can just understand what's going on. And for so many things, what I'm going to say is that when the fuel prices in the United States went to $5 and above, you started seeing some changes. And I remember that many companies, instead of having their employees come into work, what they would do, especially if, in the, if all their work could be done over the phone, is they paid them to work from home. So that was the beginning of the remote workers, because once gas prices went back down, they did go back to work. But still, it was the beginning of the growth of the re remote workers industry. With COVID-19, we are already seeing early signs of a shift in how consumers and businesses behave. Remote working is being encouraged by tech and non-tech companies alike. Profitability is getting impacted by low seat occupancy. Supply chains are getting disrupted globally, and retail stores are running out of ibuprofen, dry goods, or toilet paper in mass. Some of these changes are direct, short-term responses to the crisis and will revert to regular levels once COVID-19 is contained. However, some of these shifts will continue on, creating a long-term digital disruption that will shape businesses for decades to come. We always see a shift in business, whether it's through technology or anything that is constantly changing because we are always learning different things. And as we learn, then we begin to see a change in how business is being done and how things never really go back to what they were in the past. It's, we're always in flux, and that flux will always make sure that no matter what, we will always find a way to continue the three dimensions of impact. Pandemics have a direct impact on biological, psychological, and economic dimensions. Its intensity varies depending on the normality and morbidity rates of the pathogen at hand, as well as the time it takes for it to spread. We are now in essence in July. In fact, it's the 4th of July. And 
many countries and in the USA states are just slowly beginning to open. The real issue is that whether or not people will accept the changes that back when SARS was a big thing in 2004 and to 2006 or 2002 to 2004, what did you see? You saw a lot of Asians putting on masks and wearing them all the time. But in the U.S., people wore them only because they were forced to not because they wanted to. Therefore, as things began to open up, you started seeing where people in masks started going to the beaches, especially if it's summer in the, in the United States. They went in masks, and they were not distancing. And now you start to see a jump in numbers again. So just because you don't see it, doesn't mean that it's not out there. So always be conscious of the fact that what you don't see doesn't mean that it's not around. For COVID-19, the biological impact has been quick to escalate and has been the hardest hitting for the elderly. The psychological impact can be observed in stock markets across the world. Investors are underconfident about the future or the information of the spread of COVID-19 and its impact on global productivity is at best incomplete and at worst incorrect. The global population is also facing psychological impact with low moral and increased isolation, human contact, and freedom to travel are getting heavily curtailed. Last but definitely not least, the economic impact has been significant. In the short term, the supply of various essential products has been disrupted, and the demand for various products and services have dropped off. If this continues, COVID-19 could very well alter global GDP negatively. Longer-term innovation and changes in trend will come about as consumers and businesses try earnestly to normalize the impact of psychological and economic dimensions, provided containment is reached and the biological impact is resolved. Studying over 50 startups that gained scales around the time of the global crisis via the lens of this framework clears the mess. To start off, a recession usually brings about an acceleration of business model change, driving down costs to serve and prices. On the other hand, pandemics tend to enable entirely new categories of businesses. It also becomes quite clear that both pandemics and recessions are accelerate to innovation versus being direct causes of it. And they startups and businesses ideas were around but gained popularity at a faster rate thanks to a certain black swan event. With these learnings and frameworks in mind, below are three micro innovations that we can expect to stick around post COVID nineteen. What I'm going to do is go back and just show you how business has changed. Because if you remember in the late 90s, as corporations started to merge, what happened? Many of them were 
looking to cut their payrolls. And how they did this was very simple. They had two to three people who were, were doing the same job. So what did they do? They actually began to offer buyout packages. In fact, I had a friend who worked for IBM, and every time her husband was transferred by IBM, she had to move with him, and she always started from the bottom up again. She had worked for them for 22 years, and she was offered a buyout package. So what that meant was for the next six months, she continued to get her pay, and she had health care coverage. But at the same time, she was also able to start looking and try out to see if she was truly interested in self-employment. And that's where, in the time when you started seeing the dot-com era start to come up, but at the same time, it was an overinflated industry. And it was right around the time of the change from the 20th century into the 21st century. So what happened? There was a rise in people's fears that as we changed to the new century, computers would crash. So what did that do? That meant that many IBM employees who left their jobs, what did they do? They literally started going out and offering to repair computers or fix them so they wouldn't crash when the, you know, the change of the centuries occurred. So that was the beginning of the growth of the entrepreneur. So what I'm going to do is go back and give you a synopsis of just where we were a century ago at the beginning of the 20th century and how it's influenced where we are today in the 21st century. Because if you remember, that was around the time that there was a big, big influx of Europeans into America. And what was that influx? Because they were looking for a better life and a better quality of life. And they felt that by coming to America, that would give them the opportunity for freedom of speech and the opportunity to begin to see and change and move and create opportunities for them. But what they did was they were bringing with them their skills. Many of them in their home country would often go door to door in their little, their little town and sell their wares to their neighbors. But in the U.S., what did they do? They literally took their wares and put them on shopping carts and put them on street corners where their customers could come to them. Then many of them slowly moved into the little mom-and-pop stores, and some became corporations. But the, what you're seeing is this was the beginning of the growth of big business. And as those corporations grew, then people had the opportunity to move up into management and then after 25 years retire and get that gold watch. And it was also the time of when you had Social Security and Social Security was supposed to be able to take care of you in your later years and so that you could live a comfortable life. A lot of that began to change as you started seeing an escalation in prices. But the, it was also the idea that when the baby boomers came up and they went to work for the corporation because there was an unwritten rule at the time that you had a job for life, 
that's when you saw many of them getting the buyout packages. But after a couple of years, those buyout packages just don't exist anymore. But the idea was that it gave the baby boomer generation the opportunity to start looking at becoming an entrepreneur and growing their own business so that what you saw at the beginning of the 21st century was the outgrowth of e-commerce and online because now what we've done, instead of selling your wares on street corners, we are truly a global economy today. Supply chain will merge into resilient ecosystems. Global supply chains have long been geared towards keeping quality relatively constant while driving lower costs at every step. This has resulted in significant concentration risk in terms of geographics and vendors for most companies. For example, China scaling down due to COVID-19 and creating a not on supply impact we are seeing today has exposed the lack of resilience in this approach. There is a sharp need for a more distributed, coordinated, and trackable supply of components across multiple geographies and vendors while maintaining economics of scale. This would require global platforms to be erected that use sophisticated technologies, such as 5G, robotics, 1OT, and blockchain to help link multiple buyers with multiple vendors reliably across a mesh of supply chains. This will also have a not on impact on the adoption of self-driving cars and delivery drones as the demand for e-commerce logistics will fear outstrip will far outstrip the number of drivers needed to fulfill them. The usual business-to-business platform suspects, such as Amazon and Alibaba, are likely to step up and compete for the ownership of this more sophisticated supply chain ecosystems in the next decades. As you can see, we are constantly looking at changes because what's happening is that with the COVID-19, with people being forced to be at home, with the access to the internet, with the access to online stores, people are going online. They're purchasing more. And they're more willing to buy something if it's unavailable locally from a global company. And by stepping up and making sure that the delivery is up to par, here's another thing to think about. To cover the expenses of being imports from other countries, you have things known as an e-packet. And what's an e-packet? It's just a way of of charging someone so that it can be imported from another country. Digital bureaucracies will become mainstream. The COVID-19 breakout has caused government bureaucracies to spin into action quicker than ever before. China broke records by constructing a 645,000 square foot hospital in just 10 days in Wuhan, South Korea, drove rapid testing of over 200,000 of its citizens and new smartphones to tag the movement of the infected, alerting the non-infected of those movements. Via real-time updates 
all of these effects, as well as transparency, a biological impact, could have and improve if there were more smart cities in the world, according to the latest study by the University of Glasgow. Only 27 out of 5,500 large-sized cities are considered leading in this area. As governments learn from the COVID-19 experience, it will shift investment in favor of smart cities, as it would be critical to have them in order to manage the next black swan event. Key players benefiting from this shift in gears would be smart government focused companies such as Cisco, Microsoft, and Siemens, as well as digital city startups across Europe and the U.S. We already have things available to us where it can be delivered digitally. We also have things like apps. And what's the importance of an app? Because it means that information can be given to you in seconds as opposed to hours. Mental health support will be provided at scale digitally. It is straightforward to predict that the COVID-19 is going to be an accelerant for remote working as well as online education. What is harder to figure out is what will happen once a majority of the knowledge workforce needs to work together remotely indefinitely. It is likely that this will shift, will impact morale, productivity, and mental health for companies looking to add the human touch digitally to their workplace. The choices are limited today with Humu, a startup by Google HR Chief Laszlo Buck being a pole position to capitalize. A handful of other tech companies such as GitHub and Automatic choose to produce their insights and capabilities in order to help other companies cope. For individuals working remotely, things are looking much better. Several mental health startups, such as Brave and Movement Pedal, can double down on solving the problem isolation, while business networking apps such as Ripple can help solve the mentoring and development changes that come with being a remote worker. And COVID-19 is a terrible shock to the global economy as well. The thousands of individuals and families that it has affected, companies in the immediate term need to ensure that the health and safety of its work partners and suppliers come first. And for many of us, it's an understanding and knowing of how business is changing and will considerably change until we understand this, then we are going to have to change how we see the workplace. And you can go to my website, and that website is the number one, personalcareercoach.com. And we can work with you to help you to change and understand how to adapt your career to work from home and set up a home business.